Uh, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the 2019 William E. Boeing uh, Distinguished Lecture. Uh, I am Tom Shi. I'm the uh, J. William Urich Anastasia Vernus Head of the School of Aeronautics and Astronautics at Purdue University. And I thank you all so much for being here at this Distinguished Lecture. The Boeing Company and Purdue University have had a very long and wonderful relationship for decades. And, uh, and uh, Purdue University have uh, sent some of our most outstanding uh, graduates to uh, Bo the, Boeing, the Boeing Company, and they have thrived there. And the Boeing Company has also given Purdue many design and research projects to nurture our students. Uh, this particular uh, distinguished lectureship is still another. Uh, this lectureship enables us to bring uh, some of the world's leading, uh, world's foremost leaders and visionaries in the aerospace sector to enlighten and to inspire us. It turns out this year's uh, Boeing, the William E. Boeing Distinguished Lecture is, is extra special. And it's extra special for three reasons. Uh, the first reason is that this is our university's 150th anniversary, so it's a pretty big deal. <laughs> okay. Also, I think most of you know this is the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 moon landing and where one Purdue alumnus, a gentleman by the name of Neil Armstrong, uh, took humankind's first steps on the moon. And so that's also very, very exciting. And I just learned also that today, this, this year is also the 50th anniversary of women engineering at Purdue University. So, so this is a very, very exciting year for us. And so we're incredibly honored uh, to have uh, Dennis Mullenberg, uh, the chairman, uh, the president and CEO of the Boeing Company, uh, to give this year's uh, Boeing uh, E, uh, uh, William E. Boeing Distinguished Lecture. <laughs> now, before we introduce uh, Mr. Monenberg, I'd like to recognize several uh, very distinguished dignitaries uh, from Boeing who are here today. So please hold your applause until I introduce all of them. I'd like to start with uh, Greg Heislop. Uh, Greg Heislop is the Boeing Company's uh, Chief Technology Officer. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce uh, Jeanette Ramos. Uh, Jeanette is the Boeing Company's uh, Senior Vice President for Manufacturing uh, Supply Chain Operations. I'd also like to introduce Wayne Tigert. Uh, Wayne Tigert is uh, Vice President for Boeing Flight Tests. So extremely honored to have you here. So welcome to Purdue. Thank you. Okay, so now we're ready for the main event of this afternoon and uh, to introduce our very distinguished speaker, uh, Mr. Dennis Mullenberg. And to introduce Mr. Dennis Mullenberg is the Dean of our, uh, I think, Credible College of Engineering. So ladies and gentlemen, Dean Man Chan. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, uh, Dr. Shi, for securing this outstanding distinguished lecture tonight. Uh, one of your uh, outstanding many decades long friendships. Uh, and uh, thank you for ordering snow tomorrow as well. <coughs> I mean, holding off the snow until tomorrow is uh, uh, merely a chilly weather today. And uh, thank you so much. This is a full house here. Uh, and. Uh, I know that we are the largest among the top 10 engineering schools in the country. Uh, well, this is one way to look at how large we are and how interested we all are in tonight's lecture. As Dr. Shi mentioned, it is a special evening, a special year, and a very special speaker tonight. It's a special evening because William E. Boeing lecture is one way for us to recognize this outstanding relationship between Purdue and the Boeing Company, which is, as we all know, the world's largest aerospace company and a pioneer for over one century in everything that flies and the entire ecosystem that goes along with it. And we have over 1,300 boiler makers who are working in the Boeing Company today. Now, I've been told that uh, they're all being very well paid. Uh, <laughs> Uh, as uh, I heard uh, from uh, uh, the leader of the company, and uh, uh, many more to join uh, in the years to come. And as the Purdue College of Engineering uh, breaks records in our teaching and research and impact, 
uh, we aspire to the pinnacle of excellence at scale. Empowering industry and being empowered by the industry is the key strategy, and there's no better friends than those in the Boeing company. Secondly, it's a special year. 50 years ago, one of our Aero Astro alum, Armstrong, took a few small steps on the lunar surface. And as Earth-bound dwellers, all we humans need to do to imagine is to look up to the sky and let our imaginations fly. It is a special, special place. Whether it's the Jones or the next generation aircrafts, or it is the space travels, if this is the time. And yes, I have the wonderful honor and opportunity tonight to introduce the very special speaker to deliver the 2019 William E. Boeing Lecture. Now, Mr. Muhlenberg grew up, I think, on a farm in the great state of Iowa and went to Iowa State, received his bachelor degree and then University of Washington, his master degree. And I believe that uh, Iowa State and Purdue uh, would have a wonderful time playing basketball together uh, <laughs> and even more wonderful time collaborating on our research together. And he started, as some of you here in the audience today, an engineering intern with the Boeing company. And over the past 33 years, Mr. Muhlenberg delivered results that mattered, including the National Air Traffic Control System, including the global business partnerships, and including the national defense and space strategies. And now, under his leadership, the Boeing Company's business is booming as never before, reaching over $100 billion. The strategic directions are being executed like never before, and also the imagination, the creativity, the innovation is proceeding like never before. I heard that Mr. Muhlenberg, not only he flies, he also bikes. He bikes very fast perhaps almost as fast as how he is delivering results to the Boeing company. <laughs> Hundreds of backlogs, backlogs, business, the demand that are just waiting at the doors uh, in many years to come, as fast as he is innovating the entire aerospace industry for this country and globally. So please welcome, joining me with a big round of applause to our speaker tonight, the chairman, president, and CEO of Boeing Company, Dennis Muhlenberg. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. So much. Very nice. Thank you. Very so nice. good to have you. Really appreciate taking the time. Well done. Well done. Iowa State got to you work with Purdue. <laughs> we'll make that happen. We got it. Deal. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you, Mung, for that very kind introduction. and. Uh, those kind words, and I do like bicycling, you're right, and uh, I didn't take my bike with me here tonight, but if there are any cyclists out there, maybe we'll do a little ride a little later, uh, even in this cold weather. Uh, now, before I uh, have the privilege of, uh, of talking this evening and uh, engaging with all of you, I want to start off tonight with a uh, video, and uh, if we could, could you uh, please cue and run the video? Now pressurized, 30 seconds and counting. Astronauts report it feels good. T minus 25 seconds. 20 seconds and counting. T minus 15 seconds, guidance is internal. 12, 11, 10, 9, ignition sequence start. Six, five, four, three, two.
what you think. Just a, uh, just a glimpse of the kind of work we do at, uh, at Boeing. And uh, it's a real privilege to be here with you tonight. Uh, we, uh, we enjoy an incredibly strong and enduring partnership with Purdue University. And as you heard from Mung and Tom, we have great, great partners, and uh, it's a privilege to, to work together. Uh, just uh, prior to this uh, discussion, I had a chance to meet with 20-some uh, uh, Boeing interns and, uh, and new hires. Uh, just adding to that uh, team of about 1,300 Purdue graduates that actively work at Boeing today. So we have a strong and vibrant uh, partnership. And it's especially uh, 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 nice for me to be able to have the, uh, the uh, part of the William E. Boeing uh, lecture here tonight, uh, named after the founder of our company. Uh, this is the 103rd year of Boeing, not quite as old as Purdue, but uh, also a company with a proud, proud history and an even greater future ahead of us. And also uh, want to acknowledge just the incredible uh, uh, team that we have here. And I want to thank all of you for turning out tonight on a, on a cold evening and uh, participating. What I'd like to do is share a bit with you about uh, uh, the future of Boeing and in particular talk about a topic that I think is important not only to Boeing and the aerospace community, but to our country and to the world, and that is the topic of human space exploration. And uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about where we're headed, and uh, in addition to that, talk about some of the, uh, the opportunities uh, that we all see for the future and the incredible transformation that's happening in human space exploration. Now, before I do that, I want to just uh, talk in a little bit more about our, our uh, partnership. And... All right, there. I didn't get well instructed here on my controller. There we go. Okay, so our enduring partnership. When I think about uh, the relationship we enjoy with, uh, with, with uh, Purdue, you take a look at uh, all the activities that are ongoing. Our strong R&D collaboration is one of the keys. Uh, things like the Boeing Wind Tunnel laboratories that we have here, ongoing projects like the Aerospace Project, real hands-on learning, I think is a great example of the kind of work that we do together. And uh, especially on this occasion, as we said, where we're celebrating the 50th anniversary of the first moon landing and the first steps on the moon, uh, Purdue's reputation as the cradle of astronauts. I think it's just a fantastic opportunity for us. 24 astronauts amongst your alumni, uh, more than any other university, a full third of all human space flights done by the US have included a Purdue graduate. And there have been 10 missions that have included multiple Purdue graduates. So the cradle of astronauts is a well-deserved brand and name uh, for this university. And I think it connects perfectly with the topic that I wanted to cover this evening on the future of human space exploration. So with that in mind, uh, let me talk just a little bit about Boeing uh, to set the stage for some of the innovation that's ongoing. And then I'll move into that deeper topic of human space exploration. So when we think about Boeing and who we are as a company, we have an important mission. We know that the work we do matters in the world. People's lives literally depend on what we do. And we refer to that mission as connect, protect, explore, and inspire the world through aerospace innovation. Now the connect part of that mission involves our commercial airplane business, which I think you're all very familiar with well-known well business. Today we're introducing new products like the, uh, the 777X, the 737 MAX, the 787 Dreamliner is well-known. About half of the worldwide commercial airplane fleet are Boeing airplanes. And over the next 20 years, the world needs about 43,000 new commercial airplanes. This past year, we built a record 806 commercial airplanes. This year, we're going to build about 900. Worldwide traffic is growing at about 6 to 7% a year in terms of passenger traffic. And our estimates are that more than 80% of the world's population has yet to take a single flight. Every year, we have about 150, new, 150 million new people in Asia who fly for the first time in their life. So think, think about the growth ahead in commercial airplanes. That's part of our Connect mission. 
We also connect people with communications, satellites in space. Um, not a well-known fact, but if you go up into space today, the company that has the most uh, satellites on orbit is the Boeing company. So that's a big part of our Connect mission. Now, in addition to Connect is Protect. This is uh, our, uh, our defense business, and we know that we do important work around the world where servicemen and women and their lives depend on, uh, on the work that we do. And we have a full range of products and innovations, anywhere from fighter aircraft to helicopters to missile defense systems to the brand new KC-46 tanker, which is just going operational that you see pictured on this chart. This is a very important part of our business, also growing and is something that we do not only for the U.S. but our allies around the world. The third part of our mission is around explore. This is a really exciting part and gets deep into the space exploration element of what we do, but it spans from uh, seabed to space. We're working on things like new autonomous underwater vehicles, robots that skim the surface of the ocean, satellites and deep space exploration robotics that investigate the edges of our solar system, deep space exploration. I'll delve into this a little bit more, but this is one of the biggest, most exciting frontiers that we're on right now, literally a transformation in our space business. And then all of that rolls together into the last part of our mission that builds all of this together, and that's about inspire. We feel a duty, a responsibility to inspire that next generation of talent. And just as uh, 33 years ago, I was inspired to join the Boeing company because of the amazing kind of things we do, that's part of what we do today. The importance of the mission inspires that next generation of STEM talent, and people that want to make a difference in the world. And that's part of the culture of who we are as a company. So I wanted to share that up front just as a context for what we do. Now, when I think about our history in space, um, we were there when, space was in, when the space business was invented and have been, uh, been there every step of the way. And when you think about what's happened, uh, you know, we're drawn to exploring the universe, exploring space, because it helps us unravel some of the mysteries of the universe. It's something that inspires all of us to think bigger. And there's something about this innate fascination with space that draws our attention. And uh, over the course of decades, that's led to lunar footsteps. It's led to the launches of uh, space shuttles and satellites. Uh, more, more recently, the uh, design and building and installation of the International Space Station and new spacecraft that we're designing today. And when you think about the role that we've had the privilege of uh, participating in over the last 50 years, it's part of what makes Boeing who we are today. And you see the, the range of programs uh, that we've been involved in all the way from the original, the original space race back in the 1960s. And uh, I can tell you, uh, back in those days, and I wasn't that old back then, but in 1969, even as a young child, I was inspired by those first lunar footsteps. And uh, I know it's, it's a great story, and, and Neil Armstrong, a great uh, alumnus of, uh, of this fine university, he's a man that I had the privilege of uh, spending a fair amount of time with over the last couple of decades before he uh, passed on. Uh, what an incredible man. And uh, those first footsteps on the moon, you know, inspire all of us. And remembering that this year at the 50th anniversary, I think it's important to us. But I also uh, went back into the history books just to look at a little bit of Boeing's heritage in these original space programs. And the, in the Apollo program, that included the Saturn V rocket, the engines, the lunar orbiter, the lunar roving vehicle, and uh, many other elements of that original Apollo program. And uh, that's really at the core of, of the, the history of our company. Now, in addition to that, we, uh, we've also been continuing to nurture future investments in space. And most recently made a $2 million gift to the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum to sponsor uh, the memory of our Apollo 50th anniversary. And that's another important part, I think, of inspiring the next generation. So we often ask, you know, why do we do this? Why do we invest in space? What, what do we gain from doing that? I think part of it is it's that sense of the infinite frontier, the, uh, the sense of exploration uh, that beckons us to think about the, the, the clues about the universe and our place in it. Uh, it also helps us to investigate our, uh, our celestial neighbors and drives science advancements 
more broadly, technological advancements. Incredible advancements in medical technology, in mobile devices, computing technology, material sciences, many of which have been driven by the space program. So that ripple effect is really important. And I would argue again that there's probably nothing more inspiring that we do in this business than the human space exploration business. And that, that inspiration quotient, I think is a very important part of what we do. So that, that's a little bit of a look at history, but I wanna spend more of our time talking about the future. It's building on this proud history, but talking about where we're going. Now there is more interest and energy in, uh, in the space business around the globe today than there's ever been. At the country level, uh, in the US, I see a level of energy and investment here that we haven't had for decades. And it's exciting. And Boeing is part of that. And, and we are strong, strong advocates for the US continuing to invest in this area. Other countries are investing as well. Russia and China have both developed capabilities to put humans into space. Russia, one of our partners in the International Space Station. China, just recently creating uh, operations of its own uh, space stations, as well as uh, landing on the dark side of the moon uh, with some robotic capability. India is investing in new launch vehicle technologies. Japan has developed the ability to bring cargo vehicles uh, to the International Space Station. Uh, the UAE in the Middle East uh, developing robotic experiments on uh, the International Space Station and also investigating opportunities to send robots to Mars. Uh, a new company in Israel, Space IL, uh, just recently uh, launching a vehicle that'll be Israel's first uh, robotic examination of the moon. Australia, just starting a new space agency. Continuing interest in Canada, another one of our big international partners. So around the globe, around the globe, countries see investment in space as not only economically important, but a technology driver, a talent driver. I think this level of global competition and global collaboration is very good for all of us. And the opportunity for us to build connectivity around the globe, to build partnerships is real. And space creates global partnerships like no other part of our business. Now, in addition to countries, there are a lot of companies that are excited about space. And a few of those logos you can see popping up here. Some are traditional uh, space-faring companies, uh, aerospace companies like Boeing. Uh, you see some recent new entr entrants like SpaceX and Blue Origin. Uh, you also see companies like uh, Google and uh, Facebook who are in, uh, interested in developing their own satellite networks. Uh, you see space tourism companies, uh, companies like Virgin Galactic, uh, space tourism is going to become big bona fide business. You see uh, uh, companies like Bigelow that are developing space hotels, space destinations. Right? The amount of energy that we see here, the, the amount of commercial capital that's flowing into the space business is extraordinary. And again, uh, I love this. this. This competition in some cases makes my company better, makes Boeing better. The level of, of capital investment is going to raise raise the boats for all of us. It's gonna create a viable space ecosystem for the future. I'll talk some more about that, but just look at the amount of energy. This is, this is unstoppable momentum with governments and companies investing in space. This has never happened before. This will transform the space ecosystem. So let's talk about some of the things that Boeing is doing. And this is really exciting. And these are a few projects that I have the chance to work on a bit when I was an engineer and now I have a chance to watch as they're being developed. But I want to walk through just five examples of some of the things we're working on. First of all, the International Space Station. Uh, it's been on orbit now for about 20 years, not quite, but almost 20 years of operations. Sits up at about 220 miles above the Earth's surface. It is the destination in low Earth orbit today. Hundreds of experiments ongoing uh, every year some sponsored by industry, some by government, some by universities. It is a hotbed of space uh, exploration and experimentation. New medical sciences. Fascinating work being done on growing organ tissue in space and taking advantage of zero gravity, microgravity to build organ tissue that can't be built on Earth. Additive manufacturing in space. Imagine the idea of building 
printing satellites in space and launching them from a spacefaring platform. That technology is being developed. Other experiments on human physiology, long-term human exposure in a zero-gravity, microgravity environment, critical to successfully getting to Mars and back, understanding that physiology. That kind of testing is ongoing at the space station today. Boeing has the responsibility of working with NASA daily to keep the space station running, operating, maintaining it. We will continue to extend this as a platform for the future. Think about International Space Station as the launching pad for a broader low Earth orbit ecosystem, other destinations, as well as a platform to launch into deeper space exploration. By the way, the engineering feat behind Space Station, and my friend Greg Heislip can back me up here, one of the hardest things you can imagine doing. So you build components on the ground, you launch them into space, put them together. Once you get into space, you're doing space-based assembly, it kind of has to work the first time. <laughs> That's what our team did on the International Space Station. Next up, the Starliner, CST-100. Uh, we have three of these uh, initial vehicles uh, in various stages of final qualification testing. Uh, we will be launching this year, first uncrewed and then crewed. So crewed launches start this year. Uh, this vehicle has five seats, four for astronauts, one extra seat, tourism, Maybe a ride for the CEO. <laughs> Don't laugh too much, I might do it. <laughs> the, the exciting thing for me is think of this as a uh, space taxi to the International Space Station. This will be our first vehicle in this new low Earth orbit ecosystem. As you probably saw, uh, we have competitors again in this space. Uh, SpaceX with their Dragon capsule uh, is undergoing testing as well. Again. I think this is fantastic. The more entrants, the better. Competition's gonna make us better. It's gonna help us create, again, a viable space-based ecosystem. Uh, so watch for more news on this uh, this year as we get into launch and regular operations of the Starliner. Third one, X-37B. Some of you have seen this in the news. This is a robotic space plane uh, that we're using to test out a variety of space-based uses. Uh, including some for our government customers. Uh, this vehicle has set long endurance records in space. Last mission was up in space for more than 700 days and uh, all autonomous and robotic. And when it's time to come home, uh, you simply tell it to come home and it autonomously re-enters, does Mach 25 S turns through the atmosphere, hits the center line of the runway every time. Uh, fantastic vehicle, fantastic technology, autonomous robotic capability in space with all kinds of applications. Another vehicle that we're working on now is called Phantom Express. This is a vehicle that's about the size of a, a, a medium-sized business jet. Uh, the idea here is to further break the cost of, of launch into space, in particular satellite launch. This vehicle is designed to be able to do 10 launches in 10 days, that kind of pace. So fundamentally changing the game about getting into space. Vertically launched like a rocket, uh, and then uh, dispenses with the, uh, with the engine uh, after launch, does its thing in orbit, and then lands like a space plane using some of that robotic technology that I, I talked about. Uh, this idea of being able to launch, return, turn the vehicle, launch again the next day, and do it 10 days in a row, is going to fundamentally revolutionize our access to space. All kinds of future applications here. And then the big rocket, Space Launch System first rocket to Mars. Now, just to give you a feel for this, uh, we, are, we are building this rocket now. You can see some of the pictures on the uh, right-hand side. That big tank you see in the middle there is the massive uh, liquid hydrogen tank. All of the other elements of the stack are being built right now. Just to give you a feel for it, this rocket will be 384 feet tall. It'll have 9.2 million pounds of thrust. The Saturn V that took our astronauts uh, to the moon in the Apollo days was about 6 million pounds of thrust. So 6 million going up to 9.2 million pounds of thrust. If you want to put it in car terms, it's the thrust roughly equivalent to the, the power you would get out of 208,000 Corvette engines, right? all packed in one rocket. 
Now, this rocket has the capability to not only get us back to the moon, but to take us to Mars. That's the ultimate destination. So we're building that first rocket now. We will have first test launch next year. This will be an uncrewed launch, which will be a slingshot around the moon to test all of those capabilities, come back to Earth. And then uh, we expect to have first crewed launch of this rocket in the 2022-2023 timeframe, again, jointly with NASA. We will return to the moon. We will set up a permanent base on the moon. We will build a gateway in lunar orbit. Think of this as a large space station that will now be in lunar orbit. We'll take advantage of the Lagrangian point around the moon for low gravity launch and access to Mars from there. So think of this as a stepping stone. Go to the moon, permanent moon, gateway around the moon, go to Mars. I am firmly convinced that the first human that steps foot on Mars, that next Neil Armstrong, if you will, will get there flying on this rocket. <laughs> What's that? From Purdue. It could be from Purdue. <laughs> could be somebody in this audience, right? I have, uh, I have a, uh, a son who's a senior in high school and a daughter who's an eighth grader, and I told them both, you're about the right age, so if you want to be the first person to step on Mars, right, get ready, right? <laughs> this is going to happen, right? And, and we now, for the first time, have the sufficient momentum, political advocacy, capital investment, and technology to make this happen. So these things I'm talking about here may sound futuristic, and they are futuristic, but they're not decades and decades away. These are things that are happening now. And the point I want to leave you with is the future of this space transformation is now. And it's a great opportunity for us to be engaged. So with that path in mind, this is where we're headed. We're going to create a viable low Earth orbit space ecosystem. And I'll uh, talk just a little bit more about the components of that. From there, we're going to springboard and go back to the moon. As I said, we're going to set up that permanent base in the moon. Uh, we're working with NASA today on the gateway that will be uh, built uh, for lunar exploration. That permanent presence on the moon will, again, drive technology ripple effects that we probably don't even comprehend today, but we know are going to be beneficial. And then we're going to use that to stair-step our way to Mars. This is a, a chart that uh, is a shared vision that we have with NASA today. So this is what our country is working on. Now, I would argue that back in the 60s, um, the, uh, the Apollo program was clearly well-known across this country, well-known across the world, right? It was a world attraction. We are doing something bigger than the Apollo program, by far. I'm not sure the country knows as much about it, right? So part of what we're looking for from all of you is help tell the story here. This, this is an opportunity for us to get the country excited, to unite the country, unite the world, to inspire the next generation of talent. Uniquely, uniquely, the space program can do that. And we are on the threshold of doing something here that is historically amazing, right? And you can be part of it. Now, when I think about how we're going to do that, right, there is game-changing innovation throughout the aerospace industry that will help us make this a reality. And just to share some of the other innovation activities that are going on, because when we think about Boeing and what we're doing for the future, there is an intersection between what we're doing in the broader aerospace business and the space exploration business. We spend a lot of time moving technology, people, sharing new production ideas, manufacturing technologies, engineering technologies across these sectors. It allows us to drive our innovation machine much more rapidly. So some of those other innovations that are happening right now, you see pictured here. A couple of things that I want to point out. Uh, our newest uh, commercial airplane, the 777X. Uh, that airplane is the biggest twin-engine airplane ever developed. It'll carry around 400 to 425 passengers. We will roll out that airplane, I'm giving you a little preview. We will roll it out next Wednesday. And uh, you'll see more publicity on that, so watch the news. Uh, we will roll it out, and then we'll go into first flight uh, a little later this year. So we'll be into flight test uh, this year. It goes into service with airline customers in 2020, next year. Right? This is fantastic technology. Biggest composite wing ever built. 
most efficient twin engine airplane ever built. And it has the capability to connect any two city pairs in the world. So this old idea of hub and spoke networks is changing to be city pair networks. You want to fly where you want to fly, right? You don't want to have to go through bank shot through another city. You want to go direct to your destination. That's the kind of airplane this is. Going to continue to change global traffic patterns. Uh, we're also working on uh, new manufacturing techniques. You see some of the robotic applications on the uh, far left-hand side. This is one example of a, what we call a quad bot that is helping to build the aft body of the 787 Dreamliner at our factory in Charleston. Application of robotics and automation in manufacturing is transforming how we design and build. Digitization of how we design, build, and support. Fundamentally changing our world. We're also working on new high-speed aircraft. You see one pictured at the bottom. It's our new uh, supersonic business jet. We recently announced a partnership with Arion. Uh, this is a new jet that will be flying by 2023 for the first time making supersonic travel economically viable. This will be a Mach 1.6 jet. Initial application will be transatlantic business travel and doing it economically. The Concorde, as great as it was, was never economically viable. This will be economically viable. Uh, we're also in the upper left working on a new hypersonic airplane. Again, it looks futuristic. It is futuristic. This is an airplane that's a Mach 5 to 6, 5 to 6 times the speed of sound. Uh, we'll be flying some initial demonstrator aircraft by 2023 is our plan. All right, so again, not way, way out there in the distance, a few years out. We expect this to have both commercial and military applications. And then even closer in, you see in the middle of the chart here, uh, something that's labeled as the PAV, the passenger air vehicle. In the lower right corner, the CAV, the cargo air vehicle, these are drones. Uh, high-capacity drones that are designed to conduct new missions. Uh, the CAV is designed to carry about a 500-pound payload over significant distances. Think of this about uh, for you know, last-mile delivery, delivery of uh, cargo between factories, all kinds of incredible uses, all driven uh, autonomously. The vehicle in the mi middle, our passenger air vehicle, uh, flew for the first time uh, a few weeks ago. You might have seen it in the news. Uh, this first version is a two-passenger airplane, again, an autonomous vehicle. So think of uh, you have an app uh, that you, uh, you hit your, on your phone. This thing might arrive in your driveway. You punch in your destination, all autonomously driven. How many of you would get into a passenger air vehicle with no pilot? Of course. <laughs> you all would. <laughs> Thank you, want, you want it to be tested first. OK. Yeah. And we will. Um, but just think, think about today, uh, one of the stats that, that baffles me is you, you look across the world, congested urban traffic, constrained to two dimensions. The average uh, commute um, is getting close to being 90 minutes in these dense urban areas, 90 minutes one way right, around the world. And congestion is not getting any better. Right? It's one of the few things that technology has not yet solved. This technology is going to make congested highway traffic go from two dimensions up into three dimensions. And once you open up that third dimension, all kinds of possibilities occur. So we're working not only on the vehicles, but also the air traffic management systems that go around these, the certification systems, how do you keep this safe? We have a new joint venture underway that applies uh, artificial intelligence technologies to how you would govern the traffic system. Uh, this is a system called SkyGrid, and uh, we'll be rolling that out concurrent with the vehicles. But this is ongoing testing. Uh, I would expect to see vehicles like this in service in early in the next decade, a couple years out. Now, all of that innovation energy is fueling where we're going with this space-based ecosystem. So I want you to imagine a future now, low Earth orbit space travel becomes commonplace. Just as you would go to an airport today and get on an airplane and not really think too much about it, it wasn't that long ago when that was a new fad, when we introduced jet, jet aircraft, the 707, and the ecosystem that came with it. And uh, back in those days when jet engine aircraft were introduced, uh, new investments on infrastructure, things like airports, advanced runways, rental car services, all of the consumer goods that happen around airports, that whole enabling ecosystem developed. The same thing's going to happen in space business. We're developing vehicles 
that will allow space-based travel to be commonplace. There are companies who are working on space hotels, space tourism. Those could be elliptical flights just to the edge of space so you can get a zero gravity experience. Things like you've seen Virgin Galactic working on today. Uh, to to uh, business options that include orbital trips, a tour around the Earth. How about a destination trip to the International Space Station or other destinations in space? We expect to see a critical mass of additional low Earth orbit destinations be populated over the next decade. Uh, those will include, as I said, not only the International Space Station, but hotels, manufacturing facilities. And as that critical mass develops, there will also be an integrated transportation infrastructure to serve that low Earth orbit ecosystem. Those are things we're building today. This is something that will happen over the next decade. So when you think about that, what are some of the other enablers in addition to the innovation? There's a key role here for government, university, and industry to play together. This is a partnership business. Uh, the government has an important role to play in some of the big infrastructure and capabilities. Uh, things like the Kennedy Space Center. That's unique infrastructure that has paid dividends over and over and over. Uh, things like the International Space Station. Some of the key enabling technologies, policies, regulatory framework. Universities have a big role to play. Partnerships, research, talent development, experimentation. A lot of the partnerships, uh, for example, that we're doing here with Purdue. Uh, great, great examples of advancing the technology. And industry has an important role as well in advancing and advocating, investing, creating capital, driving investment in new commercial, commercialization of space. Uh, space will not just be a government business in the future. It will have a government element, but it will be a commercialized business as well. And we have a big role in, in helping that happen. Uh, one of the recent uh, events that occurred, announcements that occurred, was the introduction of the new National Space Council, or the reestablishment of that. Vice President Pence, uh, who many of you know from, uh, from the fine state of Indiana here, uh, has been a real leader and champion for the National Space Council. And uh, I'm honored to be uh, you know, one of the industry representatives participating in that council as part of driving the momentum of the National Space Program. And then lastly, and perhaps most importantly, is the investment in talent. And uh, none of this vision can happen, none of it, without talent. This country is short about two million STEM individuals <laughs> over the next decade, two million short in terms of uh, professionals in engineering and math and science and technology. We need to make that investment as a country. And uh, we're doing that with things like the FIRST Robotics Program and, and getting to kids early in their careers, uh, grade school level, through high school, vocational training, internships. We hire at Boeing alone about 2,000 interns every summer, many of them from Purdue. I see some of them sitting over here. Um, so. Uh, this is a great opportunity for us to continue to invest in talent. But I would argue that as a, uh, as a country and as a company, this is probably the most important investment we can make in the future. So before I uh, jump to Q&A, I uh, just want to put a brief uh, uh, bow on, on the discussion we just had. I want you to think about this future of space exploration. And while many of the things I talked about do sound like they could be a long, long ways out, they are futuristic. The exciting thing to me is that future is happening now. This is the most inspiring and energizing time I have ever seen in the space industry. And I would argue that the, the space exploration theme, this, this area of business, has the capacity to inspire generations and talent unlike anything else that we do. It also is uniquely suited to uniting the country, to uniting the world, to creating partnerships that don't otherwise exist. This has an opportunity, it creates an opportunity for us to knit together uh, the country in unique ways and to create an inspiration quotient that all of us can share. So we're proud to be a part of that at the Boeing Company. We're proud to work with our partners around the world. This is a transformational time. And it takes me back to where I started when we talk about one of the parts of our mission being to inspire 
Right? This is inspiring for Boeing and our people. It's inspiring for the aerospace industry. But even more importantly, I think it's inspiring for our country and it's inspiring for our world. So with that, thank you very much. Thank uh, Mr. Mullenberg for his wonderful talk. So we now like to invite you to ask questions. And uh, we have uh, three mic microphones on the three aisles. So please come forward to the aisles and uh, ask Mr. Mullenberg a question. But before, while you're coming forward, I'm going to ask the first question. So thank you for sharing with your very exciting vision mm. for, for the future of aerospace. What do you see as the biggest challenge uh, for you to achieve what, what you're talking about <laughs> here today? <laughs> so. Well, Tom, uh, so plenty of challenges, right? There's, there's, there are a lot of technical challenges. I mean, this, this is no doubt hard, right? This, I, I can't think of, uh, of an industry that does harder things than we do. And the technology challenges are part of what motivate us. But I think the biggest challenge still is the talent, the talent pipeline, finding enough people to go do these audacious missions. So I'm going to start with the first question back there. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Hi. Um, so the administration recently expressed interest in uh, privatizing the ISS, and I know that yeah. it, uh, it has been extended uh, to like 2023 or something, but is Boeing, as the main contractor for the ISS, someone who is interested in purchasing yeah. it, or would it be profitable <laughs> to run the ISS <laughs> as a for-profit industry? Yeah, we're gonna take out a big mortgage on the uh, ISS. No. Uh, no, hey, great question. So right now it's extended officially to 2024. We've done a lot of analysis on it to say from a structural capability standpoint, it could be extended well beyond that. So their life extension is, is very doable. Uh, the commercial business model is one that we're taking a look at. So there are a variety of partnership models. Uh, there may be some kind of a, a lease model that would make sense. Uh, there's also an opportunity to attract other business investment, open up wings of the space station, if you will, for experimentation. Mm -hmm. So we, we do think there's some viable commercial business models for the space station for the long run. And uh, we're certainly very interested in participating in that. So I'd say we're in early discussion stages. I do think it's very important as a country that we extend the space station because it is, it is the destination today in low Earth orbit and it is the enabler for deep space. Good Thank question. You. Thank you. Is there another one here? Hi. Um, so as the, the private sector is starting to rise a lot more with the space program and individual companies are developing their own technologies, do you see a lot of these technologies and companies coming together in the future to combine and hopefully accelerate yeah. the research? I, I do. And you see some of those partnerships evolving quite quickly. And th this, is, this is actually a very healthy dynamic in this industry. So it is an informative stage. Right now, there's a lot of competitive juice and capital you know, flowing into the industry, which is good for all of us, raises our game. But we're also finding opportunities to partner. Good examples with uh, Blue Origin and uh, Jeff Bezos and his team. Or, uh, we're doing a lot of collaborative work at Boeing. We're working on a next generation rocket that's called the Vulcan rocket. And the engines on that rocket are Blue Origin engines. So these partnership models are gonna evolve over time. And you'll see a, a, a framework that has both competitors and collaborators all together. And I think that'll just accelerate the, the action. And uh, one quick thing, the Purdue Cycling team will be riding tonight and tomorrow, and we'd be happy to have you. <laughs> Whew, I'm going to take you up on that. <laughs> All right. Yeah, over here. Hi. So as you mentioned, the CST-100 sort of a taxi between uh, ground and low Earth orbit. But in the future plans, uh, what do you intend to do with the CST-100 architecture? Do you intend to make it more accessible? to people on the ground to ferry more and more people between lower Absolutely. orbit? Absolutely, yeah. So or, its, uh, initial, its initial mission is designed to, to uh, be able to move cargo and astronauts to the International Space Station. That's mission number one. So I said, we, we built in purposely five seats uh, with the requirement being four. So we'll be transporting four astronauts. That fifth seat is designed for additional experimenters, uh, could be tourism. So it'll help us start to build sort of a business case and an understanding of how you would do that. I would expect over time you'll see a fleet of CST-100s. You'll probably see different size classes. Eventually you'll see ones that are purely for tourism or access to a space manufacturing facility. But think of it as a multi-purpose vehicle. Just as we built out a family of commercial airplanes, you'll see us build out a family of commercial spacecraft. And this Thanks. will be the first 
the first out. This is like the 707 of the jet age, right? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Talk and for sharing some of your thoughts with us. You outlined a lot of the really big goals that we as an industry have in human spaceflight. And I think I hopefully speak for most of us in saying that I'm very confident that from a technical perspective, we can solve all the challenges associated with some of those lofty ambitions. Do you think that we are as good or as capable at solving the non-technical mm. and fundamentally more human things, whether that's yeah. building support on Capitol Hill, public awareness, the yeah. talent pipeline like you talked about? Are we doing enough to make sure that those are not going to hinder our capabilities? And if not, what can we as engineers do better? Yeah. Well, I think, that you, I think you raise a very insightful point. And I do think while the technical challenges are extraordinary, probably the most difficult technical challenges the world can imagine, they're solvable. I think the political challenges are tougher, right? And so this is uh, maintaining sustained national funding for the space program. We have a habit as a country of investing and running hard for four or five years, and then we have an administration change and we restart and start over. And, and it doesn't maintain a sustained effort. And it's really important that we sustain the effort. So advocacy, government support, this is one thing that, frankly, all political parties can agree on. There is no reason to argue about this. This is good for the country, good for our people, and we should all be investing in it. So that sustained momentum is important. I think there's also a regulatory framework that will have to evolve. So think about as space travel becomes commonplace, integrated air and space control, managing it, making sure it's safe, you know, just as we enjoy safe air travel today. That's going to be important as we introduce robotic airplanes, as I talked about, the, this uh, combined airspace of piloted and unpiloted vehicles, commingled, making sure that that's safe and regulated in the right way without being too burdensome. That'll be a challenge. And then the talent front, right? And again, we need, we need more engineers and uh, people who are eager to go solve these hard problems. So I would, I would argue that the, that latter set of challenges, political, advocacy, regulatory, talent, probably even tougher than the technology piece. Yeah. Thank you. You bet. Yeah. So um, one of the biggest problems of launching to space right now is the cost, with uh, around $41 million being cheap. So yeah. many companies have been putting forth different designs in order to reduce the cost of it, uh, such as Strata Launch or Phantom Express with the Boeing company. Yep. What, are the, what is the projected reduction in cost from the Phantom Express? Well, we're, we're looking at order of magnitude cost reduction. So this idea of, of reusability, the right kind of reusability, and, and the right reliability of the system so you can do 10 launches in 10 days. So what, what hampers us today is it's the, the period between launches is extensive. Each launch is costly, but the fact that you don't have a lot of volume, and as a result, customers you, know, you, you just can't push enough volume through the system to make it economically viable. You're going to unleash that when you have the kind of repetitive launch capability that we have here. So orders of magnitude improvement. We ought to be able to get launch access down to something that's measured in single digit millions instead of tens of millions, for example. Okay. Thank you very much. You bet. Sure. We'll jump back to this side. Uh, sure. Um, so you mentioned uh, that uh, new destinations would be appearing in low Earth orbit. And I was curious if you wanted to elaborate a little bit on uh, what sort of new destinations you were, uh, the Boeing company was interested in pursuing in low Earth orbit. Well, we have a, a, an example of partnership right now with Bigelow Aerospace on a space hotel that they're working on. So it's space tourism destination. Um, we haven't figured out the space golf course yet. <laughs> It'll come. <laughs> but uh, we do expect space hotels. And I, I really think space-based manufacturing and biomedical facilities. You know, the space station is showing us the viability of that with the experiments we're doing. But I think larger scale space manufacturing, there's some unique things you can do in microgravity, zero gravity with additive manufacturing. I mentioned the example of organ tissue growth. Uh, there, there's a number of biomedical science advancements that will occur in zero gravity. And I think that is all going to lead us to more space-based manufacturing, space-based uh, experimentation facilities. Uh, think of them as uh, multi-use sort of mini space stations, if you will. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Tom, do we have time for one or two more? Or what do you think? I, well, why don't we, can we go just a little bit longer? I've you know, got a lot of people stand up, so maybe I'll do rapid fire here. Wait, go ahead. All right, rapid fire, sir. Thank you again. Uh, so for the future of Mars exploration, I know you mentioned your vision uh, for the moon as a lunar base platform. Do you see any human personnel 
uh, staying on the moon for extended periods of time, yes. military or commercial? And how did, if so, how does Boeing tend to assess the risk mitigation factors for that? Yeah. Thank you. Well, that's part of what we're doing with NASA, with NASA right now on this, where we're headed with space launch systems. So this idea of a permanent, resilient, sustainable presence on the moon, one that uh, is acceptable from a human physiology standpoint, you know, long, long exposure to that kind of uh, uh, lower gravitational environment, uh, how you would sustain it and resource it, how you'd have enough return flights to the moon with enough reliability to provide resources required. Uh, that's all part of the studies and the work that we're doing right now. So I th to me, those are all technically solvable problems. You just have to have the focus and sustained resourcing to, to make it happen. Very, very doable. And I, I think a permanent presence on the moon will unleash uh, new opportunities that we haven't e even imagined yet. Okay. How about one here and I'll, just, you know, yeah, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Um, this actually is very closely related to that previous question. So uh, I know the US government and you were talking about using the moon as a base for further deep space exploration. Given that it's already difficult to get to the moon in the first place, how significant are the like benefits of using the moon, like other than like lower gravity or whatnot, because it is still very hard to get to the moon. Well, there's, there's a couple of benefits. One is we, we plan to make um, residing in other places other than the Earth routine, right? So just the fact that it is hard to create a permanent sustainable presence on the moon, we will learn a lot that'll be very valuable on the way to Mars. And the fact that once you have a lunar base and a lunar gateway, you're in a lower gravity environment, so you can assemble and launch from there to Mars. The, the payload requirements, uh, the launch requirements, again, it just makes it easier to get to Mars. So I think it's both a, a preparatory step in terms of being accustomed to routine space operations, long endurance operations, and then the efficiency of, of launching from a lower gravity position. Thank you. Okay, yeah. I have a little bit of a less technical question. So in your 33-year career at Boeing, what was the best day of work you've ever had? Oh. <laughs> Ooh, that's a hard one. That is a really hard one. I, I tell you what, I'll, I'll give you two examples. Now, I, in 33 years, I, I love Boeing and what we do. And I've had, I have had a lot of really good days at this company. But I, I can tell you two that I remember. One, my first, uh, my first management job, program leadership job, was on a a uh, pr program called the X-32, an experimental plane. It was Boeing's original entry into what became the Joint Strike Fighter Competition. First airplane where I was the chief engineer, and we went from drawing to flying an airplane in about four years. So I you know, really felt a sense of ownership. And a good friend of mine, his name was Dennis O'Donohue, my Boeing friends will remember him, was our first test pilot, Marine Corps test pilot. This airplane had, among other things, the capability to vertically land and take off. Vertical landing is really tough in an airplane. Um, so big pucker factor the first time you do this. And I, I can still remember that day I was there for that first vertical landing test, my friend in the, in the cockpit, and we pulled it off flawlessly. And there's, there's nothing like that sense of, wow, first flight, friend's line is, friend's life is depending on what we did, and the sense of satisfaction of doing that. Um, and then just last year, I, I, this new TX trainer uh, that we developed, experimental jet, I got the opportunity to go fly in the back seat. I didn't really ask permission. I just went out there and <laughs> hook, hooked up with one of our chief test pilots, Bull, Bull Schmidt is his name, Bull Schmidt. Um, and uh, we, uh, we had a fantastic flight. And I got about a half hour of stick time. And you know, when you're the CEO, you don't get to do a lot of stuff like that. Nothing like flying, right? Nothing like flying. So there's a couple for you. Thank you. All right, maybe, Tom, just one more. I know I'm wearing out my time here, but I'm having fun, so we'll go here. Yeah. Hey, um, my name is Shiva Valbanani. I'm an undergrad student here doing Aero, and uh, one of my questions is, over the past few years, we've seen companies like Amazon or Uber completely change the environment in different industries. Yeah. So what do you think Boeing is doing to get ahead in developing these disruptors in the aerospace industry? How can we continue to make strides yeah. in innovation? You just saw it, right? So. We, as a company, have decided, hey, we've won. We have won for 100 years because we have out-innovated. You know, why, why has Boeing been the leader in aerospace? Because we're always investing in that in next innovation. We're always staying the game ahead, right? Uh, we see these disruptions coming. This urban mobility marketplace, electric propulsion systems, 
right? It's going to someday, it's going to disrupt our classic 737 airplane line. It will. We are determined that if somebody's going to disrupt the 737, it's going to be us. That's why we're building these new passenger air vehicles, right? Uh, space ecosystem. It's going to disrupt all kinds of things, things we can't even imagine yet, but we know it's going to be a disruption. So we're going to be the disruptors. So we have, we have a great core business that we're going to run and run well, but we're also going to be on that disruptive innovation leading edge, and uh, we're investing accordingly. So it's got to be part of our culture. We've got, we got to be big, and we've got to be fast. Right? All right, thank you. Okay, how about just one more? You've been very patient. <laughs> Very patient. And then I'll wrap up, Tom. I, I promise. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. So I had a question about the Starliner um, spacecraft. So from my understanding, it's capable of launching on a couple different launch vehicles, um, one of those being the Falcon 9. And I was a little bit curious about that decision, because obviously the Falcon 9 launches SpaceX's yep. Dragon, which is your biggest competitor. So what, what was the decision-making process um, on deciding to designed for their rocket. Yeah. Well, so the idea here again is, is we look at all this through a customer lens. So what, what would be best for our customers? Right? We want customers to be able to get into space, get into space affordably. That means sharing, sharing the ride. So they're going to be able to launch on our Atlas rocket. They're going to be able to launch on our future Vulcan rocket, being able to launch on a SpaceX rocket. That's all good for our customers. And in the end, that's going to be good business for Boeing. So, this space environment is one that's going to thrive on both competition and collaboration. So we're, we're going to compete with SpaceX, and we're also going to collaborate with them. That's the concept. So, awesome. Okay? Thank All you. All right, I'm going to wrap up there. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Tom. Well, we, we thank uh, Mr. Mullenberg for incredibly exciting t an exciting talk and inspiring talk. I, I think Purdue is a very humble place. But I think we found today Boeing is also a very humble company. They do incredible things, but they don't brag about it. But today you hear some incredible things that they're doing that we think only other companies do, but Boeing is doing even more exciting things. So let's have another round of applause to thank Mr. Mullenberg. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's good. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now I'm, now on behalf of uh, Purdue School of Aeronautics and Astronautics, I I want to uh, thank uh, Mr. Mullenberg so much for coming to Purdue to give the William the 2019. When you Boeing Distinguished Lecture at a year that's incredibly important for us. We also thank Mr. Mullenberg for sharing Boeing's very, very exciting vision uh, with us today also. So this time I'd like to invite uh, our Dean, uh, Man Chan, uh, and also our Purdue's Executive Vice President for Research and Partnership to present a small token of our appreciation to, uh, to Mr. Mullenberg. Okay, this concludes uh, this year's 2019 Wimmy Boeing Distinguished Lecture. Thank you so much for being here. Hope everyone have a wonderful evening. Thank you. <laughs>